So yeah, basically, um, I've been a community and media activist for a little over a decade now. I'll give you, uh, I was sent a really excellent list of questions to kind of address in my presentation. So um, I'll kind of get into how I got started in the first question, which was, why did I start documenting events in my city? So basically, I showed up to my first peace rally in September of 2005, and I had a camera with me. I always have a camera with me. Photography has been a big part of my life ever since I was a child. My father is a major photography buff, and he uh, got me started with cameras when I was a very small child. I think I was able to take pictures before I even knew how to write. Um, I asked permission if I could take photos at this particular peace march. And I just thought it would be an interesting thing to do, just to you know take some pictures. And um, I decided to post the photos later on on a, on a bl old blog that I had at the time. And the reaction to them online was, uh, was so huge that the server that I had them on actually crashed that night. And I realized at that point, maybe I was onto something. Um, and I, I realized that at that point, nobody was really documenting the local activist scene and that there was a demand for it, a uh, desire to see photos from events afterwards. So I decided to get a better website, I got more server space, and I began to hone my skills more in both photography and social media, which was just sort of starting to emerge at that point, um, and a short time later, videography. And I mostly document through photography and videos, and I share my work using social media. Why do I think this is important? So the importance of documentation has several facets. First of all, it's capturing history, and perhaps part of Edmonton's history that, that is not and has not been widely examined up until this point. It keeps a record of what happened, when, and why. It creates something tangible that can be shared with others, both locally and elsewhere and perhaps even help to form connections between organizations and individuals. I also view what I do as having an artistic element to it. Um, art and activism are very closely connected in my beliefs uh, as both communicate messages in visual ways. And also documenting visually, unless somebody intentionally sets out using Photoshop or some other program to purposely alter the image, um, it, it presents the truth of what happens um, for example, I recently videoed Jane Fonda's talk during a panel discussion on pipelines, and a number of people were expressing their dismay to local media and on social media that a celebrity, you know, how dare the celebrity come here and be so disrespectful, and she said this and she said that, and they actually didn't know what she said because they weren't there at the talk, so how, how could they possibly know what she said? Um, and I gave them that opportunity. Most of them didn't change their minds afterwards, but at least they knew what they were criticizing. What are my favorite platforms on social media to use and why? So I mostly use uh, YouTube for, for videos. I use Flickr for photos. I find them both very intuitive to use um, and it makes the work easy to, easy to share. Flickr generates a, a, a website address for each individual photo. Um, there are ways of sharing onto other social media platforms directly out of it. Same thing with YouTube, you have the capacity to share videos individually or as a playlist. You can embed them into a blog or onto a website. And uh, the, uh, to, to post my work, I generally upload it onto Flickr and YouTube and then I share it on Twitter and Facebook. So the sharing and retweeting capacities of these social media platforms help spread my work to a wide number of people in a relatively short period of time. Um, and uh, I have been using Instagram more and more. I didn't really like it at first. I just uh, didn't find it all that intuitive to use, but I do use it more now because uh, I like how it enables someone to take a photo and then send it out to a number of social media platforms at once. And then for blogging and simple websites, I really like WordPress because it's very intuitive, it's very easy to use. Um, most of the websites that I, I do, I, I make websites on a contractual basis for a number of organizations, and I use WordPress pretty much exclusively because it is so easy. Um, the, the groups generally want to take the websites over at some point, and it's 
basically logging in and you have all of the controls and functions in front of you. It's basically glorified word processing at a certain point. Uh, but I've also used Blogger in the past as well. So, what kinds of conversations have started due to my documentation? So there have been conversations about the efficacy of the use of social media when it comes to activism. Uh, there is agreement about it being a great way to get messages out, but uh, also it's important to be cautious, such as not accepting any and all friend requests, being careful about sharing personal information, and issues of privacy and permission, like photographing, um, for example, photographing people in public places, taking part in public events is basically fair game, but there may be times when it would be appropriate to ask permission. For example, if there's a child that's being really singled out in a photo, um, or if it's a, a situation where you think there could be ramifications on that person, if, so, if you published a photo with them in it, kind of have to use your judgment in some situations. And there have been conversations started about the subject matter itself, discussing different sides of the issues, which is really what we want to do. We want to foster discussion about issues concerning conflict and human rights. So documentation is one way of doing that. So if I could provide two examples of my documentation, many case studies that have greatly impacted my work. So number one, um, in June of 2015, Justin Trudeau was in Edmonton uh, to help launch the camp campaign of Amarjeet Sohi, who was running uh, as a liberal for MP in Edmonton Mill Woods, and he was subsequently elected. So the uh, Edmonton Coalition Against War and Racism, of which I am a part, was at that time organizing a series of, of weekly pickets concerning Bill C-51, uh, and which the Liberals had voted in favor of with the promise that if elected, uh, they would revise some of the more problematic parts of the bill. Uh, we're still waiting for this to happen. Uh, bill C-51, if you don't know, is the uh, one of these omnibus bills that gives uh, authorities extra rights in the cases of uh, anyone suspected of terrorism or anything like that. Uh, so um, all of the media who was there were inside the banquet hall waiting for Justin Trudeau and Amarjeet Sohi to make their speeches. I was outside with my camera with the protesters because I wasn't interested in what was going on inside. I was filming the protest, right? So all of a sudden I hear all this screaming coming from behind me and I turned around and Justin Trudeau was standing there. And he started argue, started uh, getting engaged into an argument with Peggy Morton, who is an ECOWAR organizer. And I got the whole thing on video. I was the only one there who actually got the whole thing. And I uploaded it, and uh, uh, it went viral very quickly. And uh, it was not actually incredible. It got tens of thousands of, video, of, of views. It's still one of my most popular videos on my, on my YouTube channel. I ended up, traditional media ended up contacting me to do interviews about me capturing this moment and putting it on social media. Um, and the experience really hit home to me the importance of what I was doing because nobody else captured that moment. And also how a large part of, of doing the job I'm doing, of documenting, it's, it's simply showing up and being in the right place at the right time, which is what happened that evening. Okay, um, Number two, second example. I was a co-organizer of the recent Women's March on Washington Edmonton Solidarity event, which I think some of you may have been at. Um, if anything shows the power of social media, it was this. Combined with the international media coverage the sister marches were getting, the main march of course being in Washington, our event page, Twitter, and Instagram all went viral. Uh, and documenting this was also important. So I was that day I was doing triple duty as MC videographer and photographer, although we did also have an official photographer. Um, we saw leading up to the event, we saw the numbers on Facebook getting bigger and bigger. And uh, when and then up until the day itself, when over four thousand people packed the north side of the legislature grounds. So to continue with that, um, Myself and one of the other organizers, we've decided to keep the momentum going and are using social media with a new Facebook page, a new Twitter, and a new Instagram account um, at WMWYEG, if anybody wants to check it out, and a new website that we launched over the weekend, which is WMWYEG.org. Number six, 
Do you think the voices of everyday citizens through your documentations have impacted the community? In what ways do you think the community has been impacted? So I, I think that my documentation gives everyday citizens a voice and a platform that they may not otherwise have had. Uh, mainstream media doesn't often cover progressive and activist events at great length, if at all, and I'm putting up entire speeches or at least more than just 30 second sound bites. And this also impacts the community in that it creates resources for future actions and the ability to start dialogues on the different issues presented. How important is freedom of speech for me here in Canada? So, I mean, acknowledging that for all of our protests and rallies, I do acknowledge we're lucky to be living in a country like Canada where there is freedom of speech, at least for the meantime. I think what I'm doing amplifies that by taking words and actions and bringing them to different and wider audiences. And any words of advice for people who are wanting to start creating dialogues or using social media as a platform to create a more peaceful and respectful community? So here are just, I, it, it's a list here I've created of some best practices that I encourage. Um, I already mentioned being careful about accepting friend requests and giving out too much personal information online. So um, if you're documenting through photos and videos, it seems like common sense, but this is the one thing I, I've done this myself. Make sure the batteries in your phone and your cameras are charged before you actually go and film something. It's happened to the best of us. Carry a charger and battery packs, extra battery packs. Um, have a spare battery with you if, you if you can afford one, because some of the camera batteries these days are proprietary and they cost a bit. And make sure it's charged as well in advance. I, Find also if you're shooting outside and it's cold or not ideal uh, weather, your batteries will drain faster. Um, if you're using Instagram, use good descriptions, lots of hashtags. I'm assuming everyone here knows what a hashtag is. Okay. Um, and have your share settings on so that you can share to the other social media platforms that you're on, like Facebook and Twitter, and there are other ones that you can connect with on Instagram as well. On Facebook, don't tag people if they're not actually in photos. It's a pet peeve of many and a really good way to get defriended. Mm -hmm. I just, I get so much stuff coming at me on Facebook and people tag me just to get my attention. I find it really annoying. Um, respect it when people don't want to be tagged. And it's easier, this is easier now that people can actually remove tags themselves. You, you couldn't always do that. You had to actually ask the person mm -hmm. who posted the photo to please remove a tag, but you can do that yourself now. Um, if you're writing and blogging, use lots of keywords in your, uh, in, your, in your posts. Try to have someone else edit your work if possible. Fact check what you're posting, what you're writing. Share links to your work on social media after you publish something on a blog. It usually generates an individual link that you can share. And most of all, when you're writing something, keep your emotions in check. I think we met, somebody mentioned things being getting emotional online very quickly and heating up. Take a, take a breather. Um, as the saying goes, say it and forget it, write it and regret it. So you don't want to put something out there that uh, you're going to regret later on. So that that's the main part of my presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments they would like to make. Now's your chance. <laughs> I think you're doing such valuable work. It's really important because it indicates that if this material is not available otherwise and it's not documented, so it's history that's recurring every day. I know, I remember, I can't remember the name of the fellow, there was another person also who did videography. Um, and he did a lot of work on Omar Cotter and when, mm -hmm. when Omar Cotter was still in Guantanamo and there'd mm -hmm. be speeches, people come in to speak and mm -hmm. he, would, he would videotape them all. And then he was hired by Rebel Media, and he wouldn't release any of that documentation. It was quite, you know, I thought it was really quite awful. And it made me realize that, that you have to, if you're doing some kind of social action and you want that document, you have to make sure you have a copy of it. So, I mean, uh, we should have asked for a copy of our own somehow, or had our own videography there. Yeah. But somehow I just thought, well, you know, he'd be there forever. And, and this went on for a couple of years, him doing all this documentation, then suddenly, I went to click on the video and it wasn't available. And I wrote to him and he said, oh no, I've just started working at Rebel Media with Ezra Levant. And so none of it's available. Anyway, I pleaded with him to make this one thing available, which he did, but. 
Wow. It was kind of, I, I, it did make me think about yep. when you have documentation, you have to make sure that that documentation is with someone who's reliably going to be mm -hmm. able to continue to make it available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. For, for like historical, but also for contemporary, for news, our local news coverage is so decimated that social media is, they have so few uh, reporters available on CBC as, as so many cut back. Mm -hmm. There's so few people. Um, I know, like, for different um, social, social movements I've, I'm involved in, when I'm sending out press releases, we're always like, okay, who, who, who do we invite? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be interested? Well, probably Erin Marie Mahar of CBC, because she likes to cover things next. And, and, it, and it's always just like a given. And, and make sure Paula Trump. Make sure Paula Trump, because <laughs> she's, if no one else shows up, Paula will be there and she will cover it. Um, and I mean, there have been lots of events where Paula's the only one there. And it's like, great. great, because we know we can always count on Paula, not just for a, a historical archive of activism in Edmonton, but for attention to issues that aren't getting into the media otherwise. I think in, in many ways, um, community media and grassroots media is really filling a gap that's being left behind mm -hmm. by mainstream media. Yes. Um, I also work in traditional media. I edit Boyle Macaulay News, which is an inner city community newspaper. And we, we publish a print edition every month. We also have an online edition and we also have social media. But it's people are really turning to community media now to fill the gaps of things that are just not being covered by mainstream media, things that weren't covered before. And now, because of all the cutbacks, they simply do not have the resources to uh, to cover. Anything else? Of course. <laughs>